Hello and welcome to another episode of CNBC's Beyond the Valley. I'm Arjun Karpal in Guangzhou, China. Now, Beyond the Valley listeners, you or someone you know may have struggled to get their hands on, say, a, a consumer electronics product recently, maybe a games console, or maybe you struggled to get your hands on a new car. Well, where has this all come from? Well, this is a result of currently what is a global semiconductor or chip shortage around the world, and that's the topic of Beyond the Valley today. Now, these chips or, or microprocessors are very tiny components that go into many of the items we use on a daily basis, such as your smartphones, but even things like fridges or washing machines as well. So they're incredibly critical, and that's really why this global semiconductor shortage is such an issue and a crisis right now that has impacted industries across the board so far. The automakers have really borne the brunt of it at this point, but you are seeing it expand to so many different industries as well. So how has this happened? And what's next? Well, I'm glad to be joined by Sam Sheed, who is our technology correspondent out in London. Sam, good to have you on Beyond the Valley for the first time. Thanks for having me, Arjun. Pleased to be here. Well, look, this is a topic you've been looking at for several months now, digging deep into it uh, and what's happening uh, behind the scenes here. So just give us an overview of you know how we've got here. Well, the simple answer is demand has been outstripping supply there's basically not enough chips to go around. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, though. These chips are made at huge factories or, or foundries, as they're otherwise known, sometimes fabs too. These big factories can only make so many chips, basically. They have to decide which chips they want to make months in advance. And this is where the problems come in. So last spring, car companies started to reduce their production targets and chip purchases as the virus spread around the world. At the same time, chip makers saw a pickup in demand for semiconductors used to support things like remote working and gaming. Then the demand for automotive chips rallied back a lot quicker than most people anticipated, but the foundries were already busy making other more sophisticated chips for companies like Apple. And to make matters worse, chip factories themselves have also been hit by coronavirus lockdowns. That's a great overview and some of the uh, points we're going to dig deeper into uh, with our guests who we'll introduce momentarily. But Sam, uh, I just want to ask you as well, look, a lot of uh, major executives of companies around the world have been commenting on this issue recently. Uh, what have they had to say about what they're facing right now and sort of how they see this playing out and even when it might end? So opinions vary, but most people are kind of saying... It's going to go on to next year and possibly 2023. Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, he said last week that he, he sees things getting better next year as more chip plants come online. But then, yeah, as I said, there are some analysts who think 2023 is more realistic. Well, Sam, that was a, a great setup. And I want to dig deeper into some of those topics with our guest for this episode, Peter Hanbury, a partner at Bain and Company at the company's technology, media and telecommunications practice focusing very heavily on semiconductors. Uh, Peter, thanks so much for joining us on this episode. Thanks for having me. So Peter, let's just kick off the conversation with the question, you know, why are we facing this chip shortage right now? No, it's a great question. And a, a lot of industries are, are asking this exact question. Um, we like to think about it really in two phases with slightly different causes. That first phase was really highlighted by the automotive chip shortage. And what happened there is when COVID hit, uh, they pulled back of their orders and uh, the capacity that they had reserved uh, went to other industries. Combine that with a lack of traceability and visibility into their supply chains, a lack of inventory, and they were hit pretty quickly and hard by the semiconductor shortage. The second phase is a bit of a different story. And, and this is where you're seeing folks like PC makers, Apple, Samsung, Qualcomm uh, being impacted. And the story there is uh, a bit more challenging. What's driving that is uh, the demand for uh, electronics, as folks have shifted to, to work from home, have increased significantly. And these industries are now being impacted by just structurally, there's more demand than there is supply available. And so instead of uh, the auto industry losing a small portion of the uh, semiconductor market that they used to have access to, uh, this is really the overall semiconductor market has demand significantly above supply. And that's a much more challenging structural problem, just given how long it takes to add capacity in the industry. 
So when it comes to the length of the chip shortage, Peter, you've got people like Elon Musk saying this is a short term phenomenon and that things will be back to normal next year uh, because more and more plants are going to come online. But the, the factories that have been announced by the big chip makers like TSMC and Intel, they're going to take years to build. So those two things seem to be at odds with one another. What's the true picture there? It's a good point. And I think there are two ways in which this crisis is solved. Uh, uh, way number one is, you know, we build more factories. Uh, uh, typically, to build a new factory it takes about three to four years. And so there is some capacity that's coming online. For example, Bosch and Dresden and uh, Infineon and Villoc announced fabs in the 2018 timeframe. And those are just starting to come online. And they're going to help uh, the situation a bit. But like you noted, uh, a number of the announcements made recently, you know, are things that are not going to show up online until 2024. So in the short term, you know, the destiny of this crisis from a supply perspective is really driven by decisions that were made back in 2018. Uh, so there will be some relief from a supply perspective, probably not enough to solve the crisis before Q2 of 2022. The other way the crisis gets solved a bit faster is from a demand perspective. You know, if we start seeing demand for uh, PCs, smartphone servers start declining, for example, as folks go back to work, that's the other way that you could solve this crisis maybe a bit faster. There aren't a lot of indications that that's happening right now, but that's really the best lever for the crisis to be solved faster uh, than what we currently think. And as you touched upon there, there are many different types of chips in the world. There's the high-end, expensive ones that go into your phone, and then there's the much cheaper slightly less sophisticated ones that end up in cars. Where is the shortage? And how much does it come from chip makers prioritizing these high-end chips uh, that are higher margin products? Yeah, that's a great point. And, uh, you know, people think about the semiconductor market as one market, and it, it's really not. It's 20 to 30 separate markets that are really oriented by technology. So a lot of folks think of the uh, bleeding edge chips that go into your smartphone or your PC. Those are really the, the, the very most advanced chips that are available. And those chips are designed every two years uh, uh, in matching with a Moore's Law cadence and then capacity is built for them. So those bleeding edge chips uh, have some shortage, but uh, the factories are essentially built as the process is designed and demand materializes. So that very, very bleeding edge is uh, you know, not where you're seeing uh, as much of the challenge. There are also way lagging edge chips, um, you know, things that sit on old six inch wafers. Those uh, are in shortage, but the capacity is a little bit faster to add there. There's more players who can do this. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, China's push for self-sufficiency means that they're building a lot of capacity there. So, again, shortage there, but, you know, there's some potential relief in sight. It's really those chips that sit in between that is the challenge. Uh, and these would be, for example, from 28 nanometer to 130 nanometer. There's not many players who can build uh, these type of chips because it's a very sophisticated technology. There's a lot of overlap in the demand for those chips from PC makers need those type of chips for display drivers, but automakers need those type of chips to control their uh, brakes and ECUs that go into an automobile. And so there is where you're really seeing a lot of the crunches. You've got uh, kind of duplicative demand across lots of different industries and very limited ability to add supply in that space. So that middle range of 28 nanometer to 130 nanometer is where a lot of the shortage is uh, most pronounced. And one of the big issues, I guess, with the semiconductor industry is the concentrated uh, supply chain. You know, you may have sort of one company or two companies that are able to create equipment or make equipment that goes in to eventually manufacturing uh, those chips. You've got the likes of Samsung, TSMC, uh, and Intel that can only make these sort of leading or bleeding edge uh, semiconductors. You know, a good example is ASML over in the Netherlands making that extreme ultraviolet lithography machine. You know, they're one of the only companies in the world that is able uh, to do that uh, as well. And, you know, we've seen instances, reports of the US trying to block shipment of, uh, you know, ASML's equipment out to China, and that could hold back China's development in the semiconductor industry as well. So, as you look at the concentration of the semiconductor industry and the supply chain, even if some of these short-term bottlenecks get resolved, are these structural issues a concern over the long term? And, you know, could that eventually sort of spout another crisis where we have further shortages? Yes. Um, so the, the semiconductor industry in general has a number of structural challenges that lead to these type of issues. Uh, 
you know, one, the lead times to add capacity or produce an individual chip are extremely long. Um, you know, two, once you design a component in, it's very hard to, to change. And then three, as you noted, the value chain is very specialized and concentrated. And so the most pronounced example that many people focus on is TSMC at the, the bleeding edge of the logic industry. You know, they have about 80% share for the most bleeding edge technologies right now. But you're totally right that if you look at other places in the value chain, you'll see similar dynamics. So, for example, ASML in lithography, ASMI in uh, atomic layer deposition. The resist industry is a uh, material that's used in the manufacturing. It's highly concentrated in Japan. And so, you know, you see a lot of this. And really, the driver is these are very specialized processes. Um, you know, some of the materials used are multiple nines of purity significantly more pure and complicated than any other industry in the world uses. And the R&D required to create those, as well as the scale required to amortize those upfront costs, are huge. And so you see a lot of what I would consider natural monopolies in different parts of the semiconductor industry, driven by uh, the economics associated with producing these complicated materials, equipment, manufacturing processes, um, and the specialization of skill. There's just not that many people who can do it. And part of the conversation around supply chain has moved on to countries, you know, like the US, for example, talking about reshoring, and in particular, reshoring manufacturing as well, trying to bring back some of that manufacturing onto US soil. And at the same time, you've got China talking about trying to become more self-reliant in semiconductor industry as well. You know, how much of a challenge are those two things, you know, for these countries? And how practical is it? It's a great question. And a lot of the, the emphasis uh, in news recently has been about, you know, different countries and making different types of investments into the industry. Uh, at a high level, you know, there's really two different goals that you could use uh, or could be pursuing from a government intervention perspective. You know, one is what the auto industry wants. You know, they want to add capacity at a lot of existing technologies. They don't need the bleeding edge. Uh, and so, they want to go invest uh, to basically build new capacity for the industry on all the existing technologies. Um, that's an expensive proposition. It's probably $40 billion to add 5 or 10% of capacity to every existing node and technology that's available, but it's possible. And uh, for a lot of these technologies, you know, you might have uh, 20, 30 different companies that could actually do it. And so that goal is actually, you know, quite feasible. Uh, the second goal is uh, more oriented around uh, national security. And that one's a lot trickier because what you would be hoping to achieve is uh, access to the most advanced technology for artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, code cracking, things like that. Um, to do that, you need to constantly be at the leading edge. Um, you need to be able to invest three or four billion dollars a year into R&D. Every two years, you've got a new technology, so you got to go build a fifteen billion dollar facility. It's very expensive. It's you know probably in the range of one hundred and fifty billion dollars over just ten years uh, to stay at the bleeding edge of Moore's law. And then added to that, you've only got three players who can do that today: uh, TSMC, Intel, and Samsung. And so, as you think about those different goals, it becomes very challenging to think about well, how would a European player or Japan? Uh, do this? Well, they don't have one of those three kind of champions or remaining players left. And so it's very challenging for them. Uh, they have other levers they can pull, like ASML sits in Europe. That's a very important pinch point in the, the supply chain. Uh, a lot of the resist come from Japan. So another pinch point in the supply chain. So they have other uh, levers that they can pull. But being at the bleeding edge and becoming the fourth player with TSMC, Intel, and Samsung, that's going to be very challenging. And if you had a, a crystal ball, Peter, and you were looking into the future, how do you think this chip shortage resolves itself? You know, there's, there's all of these bottlenecks that still exist, and there's more and more demand for chips to be put into every single thing we, we have. Um, so where do we go now? It's probably what I would say a million dollar question, but then I was thinking billion. And now it's probably more like a hundred million dollar question. You know, if you think about kind of where the industry is going, there's a lot of intervention going on. There's a lot of big claims around investment. Uh, you know, at least our point of view is that in the short term, it will continue to be very challenged. So over the next 12 months, uh, we're still going to see a uh, imbalance of uh, supply and demand. Uh, a lot of shortages across industries. You may see some industries like auto do slightly better, um, just given by the level and push that they have with the government's uh, intervention. 
and being a small part of the industry, you can actually increase their production and only, you know, go from 4% of the industry to eight. And it doesn't really disrupt the entire industry where you can't really do that with a, a bigger part of the industry. So in the short term, we continue to see it being quite challenged. You'll see different industries recover at different paces. Uh, different types of chips will recover at different type uh, paces. Um, so those more basic chips will recover a bit faster than those uh, middle uh, edge uh, chips that we we talked about. Um, and then long term, you know, we think uh, given a lot of the uh, subsidies that are uh, being pursued, the focus on adding more supply and the increased recognition by customers that, you know, th these challenges exist and, you know, they may need to prepay or reserve capacity. Well, we think the industry will eventually return to a more normal balance and may even go into a bit of oversupply if companies end up building more capacity in response to these subsidies. But that's not until probably 2024, or 2025. And just on the automaker front, the electric vehicles that are in such high demand today require significantly more chips. Do you think that will extend the shortage that we're currently seeing? The uh, auto industry need for semiconductors is a super interesting uh, part of the market. Uh, in general, the need within auto for semiconductors and related electronic components is increasing, uh, driven by uh, battery electric vehicles, hybrid, autonomous driving. And so the type, complexity, and volume of chips required is increasing significantly. As you think about you know, the historic model within the auto industry, uh, a lot of these chips that they use were very lagging edge, custom designed, uh, you know, about 100 to 150 uh, what are called ECUs or engineering control units in the vehicle. Um, everyone used different chips. And that's a big part of why they're struggling. They don't know what chips are on those boards. There are lots of individual and customized chips there. So their supply is very fragmented. Uh, and so we think as you look forward in the automotive industry, this is a, a really important time for them. Uh, and many of them are starting to do this, but to basically change the architecture of the vehicle and move towards a model where the more modern design philosophy and design methodology where they use more uh, uh, leading edge chips, uh, more standardized chips, enable greater software portability, uh, move towards a model where instead of having 150 ECUs you know, throughout the vehicle, uh, you might have more like 10 or 20 and uh, a smarter kind of brain of the vehicle uh, up front. And so this is a, in a really important time for the auto industry as they make this transition to move towards more modern design, uh, which will enable their uh, a much more resilient semiconductor supply chain. And Peter, we've spoken about, uh, you know, the auto industry in relation to this uh, semiconductor shortage. We've spoken a bit about consumer electronics. Are, are there other industries where you see this chip shortage potentially uh, impacting at all? The impact uh, to date has been felt uh, uh, pretty much everywhere that consumes electronics from, you know, small startups to, to washing machines. Uh, and so uh, the impact has already been felt uh, throughout uh, the industry. There's been a lot of focus on automotive, just given how visible it is, the, the level of employment at those facilities. Um, the tech industry is being impacted and you're starting to see that in, you know, laptops availability. And so the impact is being felt throughout lots of different industries right now. It's just most visible in the automotive and tech space. And how much of semiconductor prices risen uh, during the chip shortage? Where do you see them going from here? And, and who wins and loses out as prices rise? Now, there's a, a bunch of different ways in which prices have risen. Um, the most obvious and one you know folks really focus on is TSMC. Um, they have over the last year or increased prices in a couple subtle ways, like taking away discounts or uh, removing the typical price down curve that they they offer. Um, and then recently they've gone and actually you know raised the starting price of their uh, their wafers. Um, and so net net, we think those overall prices are increasing about 20 to 30 percent for the fabulous customers who are buying their wafers from TFMC. In the back end, you're seeing some similar price increases. Um, that's the assembly and test portion of uh, manufacturing. The packages that go with the uh, chips are also rising in price. And so as you look at the impact on end products, uh, you're looking at the semiconductor cost uh, of these components going up about 20 to 30 percent. And the impact on the cost of a product will vary depending on how many semiconductors are in there. And so a phone where 80 to 90 percent of the value is semiconductors, you'll see a pretty big impact. For automobiles where, you know, the semiconductor content might be 10 percent of the vehicle cost, you'll see a more muted impact. 
And so the cost of devices will depend on how many semiconductors are in there. Now, the price that consumers pay may behave totally differently. So for example, uh, automobiles, you know, the cost of an automobile may have gone up 5 10%. The price that a consumer sees may go up much more than that because the vehicle is in shortage and it's an opportunity to uh, fully realize the price of the vehicle. And so there can be a disconnect between price and cost due to the shortage of the components. Peter, that was a a fantastic insight into what is an incredibly uh, complicated topic. Thanks so much for joining us today on Beyond the Valley. Thank you. Well, it's going to be very interesting to see where this goes, how long it takes to resolve itself. Um, it should hopefully be in a much better place by this time next year. But the fact of the matter is, most of today's chips are still made in Asia. TSMC has a lot of power. There are a couple of other players like Samsung and Intel as well. But if there's another pandemic or if there's another supply chain uh, breakdown somewhere, This whole thing, there's a lot of power concentrated in one particular corner of the world and things may not go as smoothly as they have on this occasion. Yeah, I think that that's a great point. You know, structurally in this market, you know, there are still some issues there. We were talking about it in that conversation with Peter there, and that is the concentration uh, of power in certain companies' hands uh, and the concentration of players in certain parts of the supply chain um, as well. And I think that's going to be a key issue going forward. I guess that feeds into the geopolitics of it all. It's why the US is talking about wanting to reshore manufacturing. It's why, you know, you're in Europe. Europe are talking about this issue as well, right, Sam? Yeah, that's right. But these things will take time. And Europe can't just all of a sudden start competing with Asia. You know, they need talent. They need a lot of money. Um, And this is going to take a long time where the governments and politicians will kind of Uh, make the right investments uh, remains to be seen. Absolutely, yeah. Well, Sam, it was excellent to have you on Beyond the Valley for this episode. I think, uh, you know, we'll definitely get you back soon. Fantastic. Yeah, I look forward to joining you again, Arjun. Yeah, and thank you for all our viewers and all our listeners uh, for watching this episode and listening to this episode. Of course, you can uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, and also download the the, uh, podcast episode on Spotify, Apple and Google's platforms. That's it for another episode of CNBC's Beyond the Valley. Thanks for listening and watching and we'll catch you next time. Beyond the Valley.